Welcome back to another episode of Hashtag Weaving. Yuri, back with you, CEO and founder of Healthpreneur. So today I want to ask you a question. Are you running your business like a politician? Or are you running like a bank? Or neither of the above. You might be saying, Yuri, what the hell are you talking about? Well, let me give you some context here. And so you can obviously let me know if you agree with this. I think there is a tremendous amount of mistrust in the marketplace. There is a lot of skepticism. A lot of people have been burned. A lot of people have tried things that made big promises that delivered uh, very little in return. And when you see that and experience that over and over again, what happens is you develop this kind of callous, this callous around, well, how is this different? It's more of the same uh, short-term promises, nothing to, you know, to back it up with. Think of like a politician. They'll say whatever they want to get into office. And then when they're in office, they can do whatever they want, which is usually sometimes the opposite of what they campaign with, right? That's why on the scale of trust, politicians have the lowest amount. Uh, there was actually a study done a while ago, and I can't remember where this was or where I saw this, but it was like trust by profession. So the lowest possible profession in terms of trust that, that the public had with that profession was politicians. They were the least trusted out of any profession, not surprisingly. Want to know who was first? Take and guess, medical doctors, which in and of itself, I think is an issue because not all doctors uh, are created equal. But nonetheless, remember, whatever the doctor says is gospel. So just think about it. Like, you know, your parents might like my parents, like whatever their doctor says, that's what they take as truth, even though their doctor might be fucking crazy in terms of outdated knowledge or stuff that isn't even um, in the realm of, of reality. Anyways, there are some awesome doctors out there, obviously. So with that said, the problem with the coaching business, the problem with a lot of businesses online, to, to be honest, is that because every fourth post on social media is an ad, you are seeing ads from businesses that target you based on specific interests you might have. So if you're an entrepreneur or a small business owner, you will see ads all the time from businesses saying, hey, I can help you get clients. Hey, I'll fill up your calendar or you don't pay anything. Like you see this over and over and over again. And eventually you're like, this is ridiculous. Here we go, another person saying the same thing. How are you supposed to choose? How are you supposed to decipher who's legit and who's not? And I think one of the biggest problems that we all have to figure out a way to get around in today's environments. Because it doesn't matter if you're running a health coaching business or if you are trying to grow your business and you're seeing a million different offers, like how are you supposed to know what the hell to do? How are you supposed to know who to believe? That's the biggest bridge we have to build online. I talk about this all the time with my clients. I'm like, guys, like I don't care if you've got a successful brick and mortar practice. Like it's a good foundation. It's a great place to start and it's, you have success as a starting point. But when you come online, you're like going into a different planet with a different atmosphere and it's not even the same thing. Like, yes, you have some basic skills around building a business, but the thing that you don't have is a reputation and trust within your online marketplace. I, I say this all the time, like a lot of health practitioners become successful in spite of themselves. They have no clue how to run a business, but because they have a storefront and people just fall into their lap, they can build a practice to 10, 15, 20, 30K a month just based on foot traffic. And then that foot traffic comes in and then they're like, oh, you should talk to my brother or my mom. She would love this too. And what happens is the practice owner, quote unquote, becomes successful because the practice is super busy, right? 80, 100, 120, 200 patient visits a week, but then you burn out because you're the one probably doing all that stuff. Or maybe you have a couple of clinicians doing it with you, but it's not a scalable model. And the thing is you help everyone, unless you're a specialized clinic and you help everyone because anyone falls into your lap and you're like, well, I, I mean, I could help with Hashimoto's. I, yeah, you got a gut issues, I can do that too. Oh, you've got acne, we can certainly help with that as well. And that's how most health practices brick and mortar are run. So why does it work like that? And how does it become successful? The reality is that when someone put like steps into your door, like they open the door and they walk in, they are 80% in. And I mean, like, listen, if you got a practice or a gym or a studio, you know that's the truth. And the reason it's the truth is because of trust that's built instantly. You don't have to even be the world's best health practitioner. The very fact that they just simply walk into your practice, they're already sold. But you try that online, it's never gonna happen. You're gonna get people to be like, well, let me talk to 50 other people and see what they have to say first. Let me get 50 other second opinions and then I'll make a decision. That is much, much less likely to happen in person because of the fact that you've bridged the trust gap instantly as soon as the person's in your physical presence. So um, as you know, I, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of building brick and mortars. I think they're prisons. So 
That's why we don't do it. But they are easier to they're easier to build because of the trust factor, right? And the visibility factor. But they're also hard to scale. Like you get to a certain point where you have to open up more locations. Like you just have to take on way more overhead to scale a brick and mortar business. It's very challenging compared to what you can do online. So online, the opportunity, there's no ceiling. Like you can go as crazy as you want online, but it's infinitely harder. So it's like, choose your hard. Do you want to be stuck in a brick and mortar where you're working 120 million hours a week and not getting paid what you want, but having an easier time getting people to say, let's do this? Or do you want to figure out how to build a business online where you can work with more people at the same time, have time and location freedom, and build an income that most people think is not even legitimate? like in terms of how much money you're making, because they think you're scamming people somehow, which is fucking retarded. So anyways, you have to choose your hard, right? Now in, in my world with what we do, the choosing of the hard is building something online because if it's not, here's here's my, my thinking around this. If it's not sustainable, it's not scalable. If it's not scalable, it's not sustainable. So if you can't scale a brick and mortar beyond 20,000 a month, that's not a scalable, it's not a sustainable business because there's a lot of churn and burn. You hit a capacity ceiling, you can't go any higher. Online, the sustainability is much greater because you can scale it infinitely once you have the right people and systems in place. But it's harder because you have to build the trust gap. So that's a bit of an aside. Let's come back to the conversation at hand. What does this have to do with you running a business like a politician or a bank? The reality is that banks and politicians are not trusted. I think banks, I don't need to explain that. Like, I think we all know they're fucking evil, right? Yet they're part of the, the system, right? It's part of the, the whatever. But no one trusts a bank. No one's like, oh my God, Chase, oh, the best. It's all, oh my God, like totally the best business ever. Royal Bank of Canada, yeah, totally. Scotiabank, they're all the same, okay? Now, you, what I'm saying here is how a lot of people see coaching businesses. Oh my God, here's another coach who's like making all these promises. Like X, Y, Z, because they saw or they experienced one bad thing or two bad things, and now they think all of them are the same. The difference between coaches or coaching businesses and banks is that there's far fewer banks than there are coaching businesses. So for instance, in Canada, when you have four banks, main ones, and two or three of them are like, you know they're corrupt, there's only four of them. So you can kind of say, well, maybe this other one's about the same. But when you've got your coaching businesses where there isn't just four, there's like 400,000, then there's a lot more room for great people and great businesses to exist in that ecosystem. The challenge though, is that because we have one or two bad experiences, then we extrapolate to say all of those others are the same. I would understand if there's only a few, but there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, whatever. That's also good and bad. The, pro the problem with our industry, coaching in general, is that it's easy to get into it. You have, there's no barrier to resist. There's no barrier of entry. Anyone can call themselves a coach. You don't need to get certified. It's certification and coaches, it's, it's bullshit. It's a waste of time. Like just have a hard conversation with someone. There you go, you're a coach. Because of that, because of that, anyone can become a coach. It's like realtors. Like realtors are a dime a dozen. What makes a realtor a great realtor? Like they're hot and they wear a slim dress. Like, like you serious? Like that's, that's the world of, of realtors? No, it's relationships, right? It's like, oh, you have a picture on a billboard, therefore you're a great realtor. No, like no one, like everyone knows someone who does real estate in their family or close, like it's just so easy. There's no barrier to entry. And when you have a whole influx of average people in a marketplace, there's also more skepticism. How many neurosurgeons are there in the world? Far less than there are coaches. Why is that? Because there's a huge barrier to entry. So you're not going to have as much skepticism around working with a neurosurgeon because you're like, man, this person has been in school for 20 years. They know what the hell they're doing. Well, like, yeah, right? It's not like you had a bad brain surgery and the next one you're like, I don't know about this one. Like you have one brain surgery. That's it. So all of this to say that trust is a really, really important thing that we have to build with our audiences. And I want to share with you the three parts to building trust with your audience. Okay, so you may want to write these down. So number one is value. You have to add value. You have to bring more value than anyone else. What's value? Well, value really is in the eye of the beholder. Very much like beauty. Some people might not find these videos very valuable, but if you're still watching this, you probably do. And I appreciate that. Value is simply in some way, shape or form, helping someone uh, get clarity around a problem, give them some context, provide some actionable steps, like something that's going to be useful for them in their life whether it's a mindset shift, a tactical, you know, implement or anything else like that. So value is number one. This is why the content game is important. But I also talk about the fact that, as you know, playing the content
content game takes forever. That's why I say like it's very hard to build a long-term, sustainable, very successful business online because you have to lengthen the time horizon, which is step number two. So value and time is the next one. So you have to provide value over and over and over again and over and over and over and never stop. So if you're not okay with that, just don't even play the game. Now remember, I'm not saying that your value has to come in the form of a daily YouTube video or posting daily on social media. Remember that value can come in the form of any kind of message that's amplified. So if you were to run ads on social media, those ads can in and of themselves be considered valuable because maybe the message of the ad itself is useful and or it directs people to something that is valuable. So it could be a webinar, a lead magnet, whatever you're offering. But because with advertising, you're amplifying the message to infinitely more people than you would with your content, unless you're Mr. Beast, the reality is people see your stuff. And if they see your stuff over and over and over again, they will consider that to be more valuable. Here's the funny thing, even if it's not inherently useful. What I mean by that is we as humans attribute more value to things that we see more often. And this is why obscurity is the number one danger to your business, especially online. This is why having a brick and mortar is easier because people, oh, cool, I'm just going for a walk. There's a chiropractic clinic. It never happens online. Don't waste time building your pretty website. I was just talking to someone on Instagram, barely making any money online. Nothing, right? Just transitioning online. He's like, he's, he's getting his website all done before he launches. I'm like, why are you wasting your time on a website no one's ever going to see? And what are you launching? There's no launch. There's no website. What the fuck are you doing? Here's what you do. You have conversations with people and you're like, hey man, want some help? That's it, all right? Like you gotta like, you gotta manually work it if that's what you're doing as a starting point. You're not building a website on Wix or hiring a fucking design firm to waste time building a website no one's gonna see. Like you can build a beautiful clinic, go for it. People are gonna see it, they're gonna walk in, amazing. No one's coming to your website though, online. No one is finding your website. Don't bother wasting time with it. We didn't actually do anything with our health printer website for the first three years of the company. And then we spent a whopping $2,000 to have a designer rebrand it. So our current website, healthfrontergroup.com, like what you see there is a $2,000 spend a couple of years ago. We haven't done anything to it since then. Do you know why? Because it's not important. Now, again, at our stage of the game, a lot more people find our stuff. They search us like, you know, Uriel came, healthpreneur, is it legit, reviews, whatever. So they come across our site and it certainly helps. But you don't need that stuff. It's a waste of time. In time, yeah, sure, go for it, but not right out of the gate. So anyways, we have to add a lot of value, whether that's content or paid content that's amplified. Just get in front of people, okay? All the time, all the time, never stop, never stop until you die. Just keep going, okay? So value and time, just forever. That's that's your time frame, okay? Like how long, how, Yuri, how long is it gonna take? Forever, that's how long it's gonna take. You don't like that? Cool, go work for someone else. It's really simple. So value, time, and the third thing is proximity. As I said at the beginning, if you walk into a clinic or if someone walks into your clinic or, or your gym, they're in. So let me let me share with you how I hired my trainer. There was a gym, kind of like an athletic training facility close to my house. I walked in. The first trainer who was there happened to be between clients. I ended up talking with him. I was like, cool, let's uh, let's set up a session. And that was it. Done. I didn't, I wasn't like, let me talk to every trainer in the facility. I'm going to go to a couple other locations and see what's going on. I just said, fuck it. Like I was in the door. This is convenient and let's do it. It just so happened that he was the best fit anyways. It's been great. So proximity is power. When someone walks into your door, they're sold, they're in, okay? Online, there is no proximity. The closest you can get to physical proximity online is a live Zoom call. That's as close as it gets, okay? So live Zoom call, video Zoom, okay? So whether that's a conference call or a sales call, whatever, that's like proximity as much as we can possibly get online. Audio call, okay? So a call just on audio. Then you have a video like this, and then you have written contents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is why I'm a huge fan of video because it gives people a sense of your tonality, your 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 mannerisms that you can't transmit in writing as easily. So I don't enjoy writing necessarily, although I write every single day because I want to continue developing the skill even 20 years after I started. But video, I can promise you, will produce way better results, just in my experience. So with that said, that's why I'm a huge fan of having webinars, right? Because if you have a webinar in your business as the main content engine slash conversion mechanism, it gives you the opportunity for someone to consume your stuff and your expression, your passion, your enthusiasm, as opposed to if they just read a PDF, right? Like you guys know, like I bring the fire, right? Like I swear I'm passionate. Um, I tell you like it is. I can't get that same, you can't feel this, that same conviction in my writing. 
yes, the writing is good, but it's not as powerful as the video, right? And that's why like, I'm a huge fan of video because video gives people a sense of like closeness to you. And when you have that with some value that's being added and time, value, time, proximity, those are the three ingredients to building trust. Yuri, how long is it gonna take me to build trust? I don't know. It depends, right? Everyone's coming into their own baggage. Some people are like, this just feels right. I feel like I connect to you. They'll be in on a date. Other people are like still crossed armed several months later, several years later. They're like, I still, I still don't think you're real. Cool. All the best with that, right? So like everyone's on their own journey. Everyone's coming in with baggage. They have their own bullshit. You can't really accelerate any individual's trust building process other than what you can control, which is constantly sharing value, doing it as long as possible and being as proximal to people in your online world as much as possible, which is why video is very powerful. So if you do those three things over and over and over again, you will build trust. Now, again, just to be clear, I'm not saying you have to run content. Like you can do this whole thing with your perfect client pipeline. You run ads to a webinar and you just scale that. That's it. Like you could have no social media presence. You could have no YouTube channel. You could have no podcast, which is exactly what we did for the first three years of Health Runner, right? We didn't do any of this stuff. I didn't do any YouTube videos. I didn't do any social media for the first three years of the company. I did it in my previous company. It took me seven years to make my first million. And yeah, cool, right? But like, I don't know if you want to play that game. It takes a long time. So for us, it was, you know, from scratch to seven million to, to seven figures took us seven weeks with Healthpreneur. And we built this sucker up. We built the machine. And in the past two years, I'd say a year and a half, really, we said, you know what? We're, we have a good foundation now. Like we know this is working. We have the ad stuff kind of figured out. There's obviously stuff we're always improving, but we have the bandwidth, the team, et cetera, to really go like gangbusters on the content side of things. And that's why like I do a huge volume of this stuff because I want to build a business and a brand that is more valuable than anything else on the planet. That's it. So, but to start there and expect results from it, it's going to take a very long time. So anyways, I hope this makes sense for you. And I just want to finish with this. Politicians make short-term, they, they make short-term decisions because they work on short horizons. For Four years, whatever I got to do and whatever I need to do to get an office. And in my four years, it's all good. I can give a shit if I blow up the planet 10 years later, but in my four years, that's all I'm concerned about. For the most part, when you make, when you think short-term, you make short-term decisions and short-term decisions rarely ever lead to anything good. So as an example, in my previous business, a large percentage of our revenue was generated from affiliate promotions. And after doing that for several years, I felt sick to my stomach. And that's part of the reason I wanted to get out of that space altogether. I don't do any affiliate stuff anymore. In seven years with Healthpreneur, I don't think we've done a single affiliate promotion. And we probably won't unless it's a really good, you know, collaborative partnership with us for our clients or our audience. Because in my previous business, because we we're selling stuff at a lower ticket, we had to make up on the back end so what we weren't making up on the front end. So someone would buy a diet book and then tomorrow they'd get a promotional email to go buy someone else's diet book. And all because we wanted to make up the numbers. So the conversation was around, what do we have to promote this week to make money? Like that was the conversation. And that's a very, very ugly business to run. The conversation now is about what do we have to do today to be relevant and the leader in the world in a hundred years from now. That's a very like, again, our, our goal with health is that it outlasts my life is that we are the last standing brand in the health space. Like no one, like no one even comes close. And I want you to understand this. Like I have no intention of selling this company, zero. Like we have an, a, I love what I do. I love the business. It cash flows. It's great. Like, why would I want to sell this? But we've built it to sell. If you build a business that's sellable, why would you want to sell it? Assuming you enjoy what you're doing. So I have zero intention to sell. And uh, everyone we hire always asks me like, what's your intention? Is he in good health? Is he going to be around? Is he going to like die tomorrow? The answer is no, I'm going to be here. And the business will outlast my life. When with that type of time horizon and some of the vision uh, the vision that we have, you start thinking through things very differently. Like, yeah, like you want to hit short-term objectives and make sure you can meet payroll, like basic stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. But it's never going to be like, what do we have to do to make a quick buck? And if we ever had to have that conversation, it can never be at the compromise of our integrity, our reputation, or our long-term vision. And I think that's something that's, it's hard to transmit to the to the marketplace. You, you might say like, how, how are you different than some other coaching business? Well, that's part of my explanation right there, right? But that's, that falls on deaf ears half the time. 
because I could just say whatever I want. But unless you're actually like working with us and our on our team or like embedded in our culture, you know that that's where marketing comes in. That's where we have. That's why I constantly want to share this message of like I don't fuck around. Well, how do you stay in business for 20 years if you're doing nonsense? You don't, right? Like even in my other business, although we did like some of the stuff I mentioned with the affiliate stuff, the intention is always to put out the best possible stuff, right? The best books, the best nutrition programs, the best supplements. It was never around like let's cut corners. Um, so that was never there, but like there was just like this this churn and burn of because of the nature of the business model, we had to make money all the time and it was just exhausting. So that's why it's like, it's really, really important to consider your business model because a lot of your day-to-day -day activity will be dictated by the type of business model or the pricing that you have. So value, time, proximity. That is how you build a lasting business that builds more trust. When you have more trust in your marketplace, you're able to stand out from everyone else. And when you stand out from everyone else, well, it's easier for people to do business with you because they see you as different and they trust you more than another option. Make sense? So anyways, let me know in the comments below what you've liked most about this. And um, that's what I got for you today. Thank you so much for hanging out. I appreciate your time and attention. Be sure to watch the next video. It's going to be a banger. I'm going to keep you in suspense. It's going to be really, really good. But check it out and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks so much. Today, I'm going to share with you five lessons I learned from David Beckham. So David and I, Bex, as he's known, we go way back. Back to the old days, we share a lot in common. Uh, we love soccer. And I wanna share five lessons I learned from him that I think are very, very pertinent to you and your business and your growth as a human. 